Okay, so as someone wisely pointed out earlier, with our pizza calculation, with the 10 cups of cheese, that's provided you have enough of the other stuff, right? So that's not necessarily the case. So let's look back at our pizza recipe. And what we have available, we have four crusts, 10 cups of cheese, and 15 ounces of tomato sauce. How many pizzas can we make out of that? And you can't skimp on the cheese or the sauce. Three, two, one. What about four? No? How do we figure this out? So if, if we had four crusts, how many pizzas could we make? Four. Yeah, provided we've got enough of everything else. So we could write that out like this, four crusts, and we get one pizza per crust, duh. So that would give us four pizzas. Um, the 10 cups of cheese thing we've already done, but I'm going to do it again anyway. 10 cups of cheese times one pizza for two cups of cheese. All right, so that gives us five pizzas. And then the sauce, we've got 15 ounces of sauce. And we need five ounces for every pizza. 15 divided by five is three. Okay, so the people who said three were correct. As we're making pizzas, we make one pizza, we make two pizzas, we make three pizzas, we've used up all the sauce. Pizza making stops. You can't make any more. What happens to the extra crust and the extra cheese? They just sit there. They're not part of the pizza. OK? They're just still there, next to the pizza, maybe? I don't know. Can we make four plus five plus three pizzas? No, that's silly, isn't it? You can't just take those numbers and add them together, because they each need the others. But that's what some, sometimes students do with these limiting reactant problems, they'll do these calculations and then they'll add the numbers together. So if you think about that with pizzas, it doesn't make any sense. But when we're talking about chemicals, a lot of students don't even know what makes sense. And so you just start doing things, right? So try to think about it and understand what's going on. Think about pizza. Maybe buying a pizza would help you to think about pizza. We should go on a field trip, yeah, and, and go watch them make pizzas. And then we'd have to eat the pizzas, right? So the process here is that we take each ingredient and figure out how much product we could make. The answer to how much we can make is the smallest. It's the smallest. Because when we've hit that amount of product, we run out. We've run out of that ingredient, and so it doesn't matter that there's extra stuff left over. OK? Here it is in picture form. Four crusts make four pizzas. 10 cups of cheese make five pizzas. 15 ounces of sauce makes three pizzas. This is the least amount of product. That's how much we can make. This is the ingredient that is limiting how many pizzas we could make. If we had more sauce, we could make another pizza because we have four crusts. So we call this the limiting ingredient or the limiting reactant. Okay? And then this is the yield, the theoretical yield. So here the sauce is the limiting reactant. It's the reactant that makes the least amount of product. The maximum number of pizzas is called the theoretical yield. This is based on the idea that everything is working correctly, um, that we're not screwing up as we make the pizzas. OK, so in a chemical reaction, just like when you're cooking, I mean, if you, you set out to make pancakes or bake bread or something, it's highly unlikely that you have the exact amount of each ingredient on hand, right? 
usually there's plenty of extra flour or something and you run out of eggs. Something like that happens. In chemical reactions, it's very unusual to have just the right amount of each reactant. So it's very likely that one of the reactants is going to get used up and that's going to limit how much of the product can be made. The limiting reactant is the one that gets all used up. Anything that is not a limiting reactant will not get used up, and that's called an excess reagent. So in our pizza experience here, the, the sauce was the limiting reactant. We used up all the sauce. We had leftover cheese and leftover crust. Those were excess. They were extras. Okay. How much you actually make is called the actual yield. Right? That's very cryptic, isn't it? The actual yield is how much you actually make. What if we burn a pizza? We got distracted by a YouTube video of kittens or something, right? And we didn't hear the timer, and we burned one. Or we dropped one on the floor, and the dog ate it. Stuff happens, right, when you're making food? So in theory, you could make three pizzas, but you screwed up, so you only ended up with two pizzas. We use a percentage to quantify how well we did. So a percent yield expresses the efficiency. It takes the actual yield, how much you actually made, and you divide by how much, in theory, if everything went perfectly, you could make, and then that's multiplied by 100. So if you have enough stuff to make three pizzas and you make three pizzas, your percent yields 100. You're awesome, right? Yes, the formula for Tuesday's experiment was very similar. There we called it a percent recovery because we, were, we knew how much we started with, um, and so we should get that much back at the end. Um, so it is the same process, just the words are slightly different. We use percentages a lot because they... Um, they have a broader application than just an individual number. If I say, well, my actual, my actual yield was, was two pizzas, we don't know if that's good or not because compared to how many pizzas were you trying to make? Were you trying to make 200 pizzas? Then you did a really crappy job. If you were trying to make three pizzas, you, yeah, you did an okay job. If you were only trying to make two pizzas, then you were awesome. So percent gives us um, some context. So it's the actual yield divided by the theoretical. It's the part that actually got made divided by the whole thing that could possibly be made. It's usually the smaller number divided by the larger number. So in this instance, the theoretical would be three? Yes. For the pizza thing, the theoretical would be three. Because that's, that's the most we could make if everything goes right. We couldn't make any more because we ran out of sauce. Something could happen where we screw it up. So this is just a summary of these terms. Limiting reactant, excess reactant, theoretical yield, actual yield, percent yield. You need to know those. And, um, isn't the actual yield usually only given in a problem? Yes, the actual yield is usually given in a problem. Because that comes from an actual experiment. And when you're doing a homework problem, a word problem on a test, you didn't do the experiment, so you have no way of determining what it is. In lab, you will measure your actual yield. Because you did the experiment, you go weigh your product, that's your actual yield. The theoretical yield is calculated using stoichiometry. <coughs> so let's use pictures and apply this to a chemical reaction. So we looked at this equation when we talked about balancing equations. So one molecule of methane reacts with two molecules of oxygen to make one molecule of CO2 and two molecules of water, right? If we have five molecules of CH4 and 18 molecules of O2, what's going to happen? Well, if we, the five molecules of methane, if we had plenty of oxygen, we could get five molecules of CO2 out of that, right? Because this is one CH4 makes one CO2. So this is like taking the number of crusts of pizza, pizza crust, and finding out how many pizzas could we make from that. 
And then we're going to look at the other ingredient, the oxygen. We have eight molecules of oxygen, and we're going to get um, one CO2 for every two molecules of oxygen. That came from the balanced chemical equation. So we can only make four CO2 molecules. This number is less. So this is the amount of product that we can make. Because when this happens, we've run out of oxygen, and that other C CH4 molecule is just going to sit there. It's, it can't do anything, just like the crusts and the cheese are just going to sit on the counter. So this is the limiting reactant. It produces the least amount of product. The least amount of product is the theoretical yield. Any questions? So again, there's different ways of thinking about this. And this is what your, your book talks about doing. Um, so if you've got masses instead of moles, um, you start with the mass of A, convert to moles of A and moles of the product. You start with the mass of the other reactant, convert to moles, convert to moles of the product. You look at these numbers and say, which one is the smaller number of moles? And then you take that one and convert to the mass of product. Um, that is a valid way. I think it involves a little too much thinking, um, and so I'm not going to do it that way. So I'll, do I have a slide for that? No, I don't. Here, I'll just fix this one up then. So this, this is what I like to do. Let's just get rid of that. Should have made that bigger, but it's too late now. Okay. From moles of product, go to grams of product, go to grams of product. And then, which is smaller? And just, just skip that part. So what we're doing here is grams to moles to moles to grams, grams to moles to moles to grams, going to the same amount of, same product each time, but starting with one of the reactants, starting with the other reactant. And you just do the whole process that we're getting familiar with, grams to moles to moles to grams. You get to the end of that, and then you look at your two answers. You pick the smaller one. That's your mass of product. Done. The one that gave you the smaller product is the limiting reactant. So let's do an example. I think I skipped one. No, I didn't. OK. So ammonia can be synthesized by this reaction. What's the theoretical yield of ammonia in kilograms that we can synthesize from 5.22 kilograms of hydrogen and 31.5 kilograms of nitrogen? So let's put these numbers here. Um, H2, so 5.22 kilograms. And nitrogen, 31.5 kilograms. And what are we trying to find? Kilograms of ammonia. So how do we know this is a limiting reactant problem? They're giving us masses of both reactants. If they give you masses of two reactants, you need to do two calculations. Heaven forbid if there's three or four and they give you three or four masses, then you have to do three or four calculations. We're not going to go there very often. OK, so this is another one with the kilograms and the kilograms. Um, how should we handle this? We could do the conversion at the end and the beginning and the end. We could just let the kilo sit there and bring it back at the end. Or we could do that fast conversion to grams and then convert back to kilograms at the end. One, two, or three? Two. Two. Thank you. That's what I was hoping you'd say. OK, so we need to do two calculations. So the first one we're going to take and do grams to moles to moles to grams using hydrogen going to ammonia. So 5.22 kilograms of hydrogen. And we're just going to let the kilo sit there. 
we're going to pretend he's not there for now. So grams of hydrogen to moles of hydrogen. To moles of the product, NH3, to grams of the product. And the moles go down here. And moles of H2 go down there. And we're ignoring the kilo for now, so we're going to put grams of H2 down here. And that cancels just the grams of H2, not the kilo. Mole ratio is the easiest, so I'll do that first. Um, 2 in front of the NH3. So I'm going to write 2 in front of moles of NH3. In front of the hydrogen is a number 3, so I'm going to put 3 down here. Then I need the molar mass of, of H2. So that's 2 times 1.008, which is 2.016. And we need the moles of ammonia, grams of ammonia per mole. And so check me, but I think that's 17.034. Fourteen point oh one plus three times one point zero zero eight. Thank you. So I'm going to do the calculation five point two two, ignoring the kilo, divide by two point zero one six times two divided by three times seventeen point zero three four equals starting number has three sig figs. So my final answer here should have three sig figs. 29.4, there's the three, and write down two more. And the kilo didn't cancel, so I've still got that here, kilograms of NH3. Everybody okay with that? I'm just going to leave that there, because this is not necessarily my final answer. I have to do another calculation. It's very, very similar. But now I've got 31.5 kilograms of N2. So I'm going to go grams to moles to moles to grams. Again, just setting the kilo aside and bringing it back at the end. I'm going to go to moles of N2 to moles of NH3. grams of NH3. Put the moles down here and the moles of nitrogen and grams of nitrogen. Then I need mole ratios and molar masses. So the mole ratio here in the middle, um, there's still a 2 in front of NH3. Um, the nitrogen has an understood one in front of it. So I get two moles of NH3 for every one mole of nitrogen. Molar mass of N2 is just 2 times 14.01, so that's 28.02. Um, I don't encourage doing math like that in your head. Um, some of you I've seen on your lab reports, you're, you're adding numbers longhand, I can tell, because you're, you're writing it out and you're screwing up sometimes. You have a calculator, use it. If you want to do it longhand, fine, but check your work. It's dumb to get the wrong answer because you added wrong. So that's 28.02. This one, this term is exactly the same as the term for the other one, isn't it? Because we're going from moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia, it's the same. So we don't have to calculate it again or anything. And that's one of the reasons why I don't see the point in stopping here at moles, identifying which one is smaller, and then continuing on to grams. Doing both of these like this is very little extra work, and it's less confusing. So that's what I like. So 31.5 31 divided by 28.02 times 2 times 17.034 equals. Um, again, three significant figures, 38.299. 
And the kilo didn't cancel out, so we still got that kilograms of NH3. I have two answers here. There's only one answer to the problem. I pick the smallest number. I don't add them together or subtract them or anything crazy like that. I just pick the smaller one. This one's smaller. This is the maximum amount that can be made, the theoretical yield. Because when you get to 29.403 kilograms of product, you run out of hydrogen. You can't make any more. So this is the theoretical yield. So let's, as our final answer, let's round that to the right number of significant figures, 29.4 kilograms of NH3. That's how much can be made. On, on um, a multiple choice test, you're going to have to pick one. Um, on worksheets and on labs, um, sometimes what happens is people will do both of these calculations and they'll just leave the numbers sitting there. I can't count that as fully correct because you have to choose one of the answers. If you circle it, that's going to be good enough for me. But you've got to somehow indicate which one you're choosing. What if they wanted to know what's the limiting reactant? Hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is the limiting reactant. Because the hydrogen is the one that gave the smallest amount of product, meaning that the hydrogen got used up first. It limited how much was made. So that makes this one an excess reagent. There was extra N2 left. Any questions? OK, mining companies use this reaction to obtain iron from iron ore. Um, so iron ore is you know, stuff in the rocks. And it's, a, it's an ionic compound of iron with other things. Um, much of it is this FTO3. So they react it with carbon monoxide, and they get iron and CO2. Well, that could generate CO2 in the air, too, but probably not very much. So we're given this information, the reaction of 167 grams of FTO3 with 85.8 grams of CO produces 72.3 grams of iron, determining the limiting reactant, theoretical yield and percent yield. OK. Well, let's start by taking the numbers and writing them under the balanced chemical equation. So I have 167 grams of that one and 85.8 grams of this one. And it says it produces 72.3 grams of iron. Determine the limiting reactant, the theoretical yield, and the percent yield. So we have two different amounts. Both, both reactants we have a mass for. So to figure out how much product can be made, in theory, we have to do the two calculations. And we have to do that to figure out which is the limiting reactant. We can't look at this and say, well, there's a lot less of this. This must be the limiting reactant. You can't, you can't just eyeball it like that. You have a 50% chance of being correct, but that's not really good enough here. Why did they tell us how much iron is being produced if they want us to calculate how much is being produced? That's the actual yield. So they're saying this was reacted with this, and it produced this. This is the actual yield. And it's very important to recognize that. So this is our actual yield. They have to tell you that somehow. So. Calculating the theoretical yield, then we're calculating the mass of iron in grams to get the theoretical yield. So we're going to do two calculations. We're going to go Fe2O3, grams to moles to moles to grams of iron. And then separately, we're going to take grams of CO to moles to grams. Sorry, moles to moles to grams. It's best to write these things down. OK, so I like to do the first one first. So 167 grams of Fe2O3. Grams to moles to moles to grams. So moles of Fe2O3. 
one of the things I like about math and a lot of things in chemistry is that you can learn a pattern and imp apply it to lots of different situations. If you never learn the pattern, um, it ends up being horrendous. You gotta learn the pattern. Grams to moles to moles to grams. So then I gotta fill in the denominator units. Thankfully this one doesn't mess around with kilograms or anything fun like that. And this would be grams, Fe2, O3. Moles in the middle, that's the easy one. Um, two moles of Fe are made from one mole of Fe2, O3. This is the next easiest one because it's an element, and you just look at the periodic table and it's 55.85. One mole of iron weighs 55.85 grams. Uh, I need the molar mass for this one, though. I'm going to do this way at the top. So Fe2O3. So that's going to be two times the mass of iron plus three times the mass of oxygen. One fifty nine point seven. So one mole of Fe two O three weighs one hundred and fifty nine point seven grams. So I'm going to do that calculation one sixty seven uh, divided by one fifty nine point seven times two times 55.85 equals. Um, my results should have three significant figures, so I'm going to write down the three and two extras, 0 0.80, and that's grams of iron. I'm going to do a very similar calculation using the other reactant. eighty five point eight grams of carbon monoxide. Go to moles of carbon monoxide. Go to moles of iron. Go to grams of iron. So here in the moles, um, two moles of iron from three moles of carbon monoxide. Two moles of iron, three moles of carbon monoxide. The last one is the same because it's just the molar mass of iron, 55.85. And then I need the molar mass of carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide would be 12.01 plus 16. I believe is, oops, I need those zeros. It's what, 28.01 grams per mole. One mole of carbon monoxide, 28.01 grams. Are you okay? 85.8 divided by 28.01 times 2 divided by 3 times 55.85 equals 114, that's our three sig figs, 0 0.05 grams of iron. Those are pretty close. But one is smaller than the other. This is the smaller one. That's our theoretical yield.
if everything worked perfectly, we didn't drop any pizzas, didn't get distracted watching kittens on YouTube, we could make this much. That's our theoretical yield. Um, so that's the answer to this question, although we should, you know, round it for that, 114 grams. Say, sometimes I call him Theo and sometimes I call him Ty. Theoretical yield is that. What's the limiting reactant? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. It's the <coughs> reactant that gives us the smallest amount, right? So limiting reactant equals O2. What? There's no O2 in there. I'm sorry. CO. What's the percent yield? We're going to calculate that. Percent yield is the actual yield over the theoretical yield times 100%. So the actual is up here. They gave us that. 72.3 grams divided by the theoretical yield. I don't want to use the rounded one here. I'm going to use the one with the two extra digits, 114.05 grams times 100. Percent there is used as a unit. The grams cancel out. The, the units should always cancel out when you're doing a percentage. So we got 72.3 divided by 114.05 times 100. How many significant figures should this percentage have? Three. 63.393 percent. And then round it, 63.4. So the percent yield here was 63.4 percent. Any questions? If you were operating this mining company, you would be very interested in this number. Because you're only getting 63.4% of the possible iron out of your iron ore. So you're going to look for ways to increase your percent yield. What if your percent yield is over 100%? Could that happen? Did anybody get over 100% in their yield from Tuesday's experiment? Yeah, some people did. Does that mean you created copper? No, it means that something didn't go quite right. Um, it generally means that there's something extra in your product, because you can't make more than you can possibly make, right? But you could have extra stuff contaminating. So, it is possible to end up with a percent yield over 100%, but it means that something went wrong.